I'm walking around the house with my code book and I'm trying to understand how do I deal with ducts that are inside a building cavity. And in this case, we have a return system here and it specifically says in the R403 section, the mechanical section of the energy code, that you can't have, you can't use building cavities as pressurized duct systems. Therefore, the way that they installed this return system with a ducted uh, system here is, is compliant with the code. If they had put drywall up and were trying to take pressurized air back to the furnace through the cavity that was created with drywall and wood studs, that would not be compliant with the code here. Uh, so they've done a good job here, uh, but we wanted to just point that out that you cannot use building cavities as pressurized ducts. In this case, it would be a negative pressure pulling air back to the furnace, but you can't do it on the supply side on a positive pressure as well. And it turns out that most often when you see building cavities used as duct systems, that um, it's on the return side. And the last thing I wanted to point out that there's an inconsistency in the code. The energy code says that you can't use the building cavity as a pressurized duct system, but the IRC, the mechanical section of the codes, say doesn't necessarily say the same thing. So there is a section in this code as well as in IRC that's about applicability, which means that the most restringent stringent version of the code or the 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 best performing compliance section of the code should prevail. And in this case, uh, having true ductwork inside this cavity is the, the thing that's going to create the best performance for the house. And so this is the one that should overrule the IRC section that says that you could build a, um, a plenum or a cavity that has pressurized air moving through it. We have to do a duct sealing test on a house and the rough stage of construction is the best time to do it uh, because they've installed the duct, but they've also air sealed this duct. And you can see the mastic coming down what we call a Pittsburgh joint or a manufactured joint where two pieces of duct actually clip together here. And as these systems get tighter and tighter to meet the requirements of the code, these manufactured joints start leaking. So we want to be sure that we're going to get this mastic product, uh, air sealing product, on all joints of the system. Relatively new to the energy code is a requirement to insulate our hot water lines. And if you have a hot water line that is a three quarter inch line or bigger, it needs to be insulated, even if it's inside the conditioned space, from the water heater to whatever fixture it's going to. Uh, so we should be seeing R3 insulation on all of those three quarter inch lines that are carrying hot water. I wanted to talk about uh, duct boots and when they're penetrating the building thermal envelope. So in this case, we have a duct system in the ventilated attic and the duct boot is supplying air to the conditioned space. So it's going to have to penetrate the drywall plane, which is our primary air barrier on the high side of the house that's separating conditioned space inside the house from unconditioned space up there. So whenever you have a duct boot that's penetrating the building thermal envelope, either of the primary air barriers uh, systems there, uh, it needs to be sealed to that surface that it's penetrating. Now, if you were doing an Energy Star house, it would be every surface that it's penetrating, regardless of if it's the building thermal envelope. And that's the direction that the code's moving. But in the 2021 IECC, all you have to do is seal it to the drywall uh, connection to an unconditioned attic, or if you have a uh, uh, duct boot that's coming up uh, through a floor that's over a garage, that would be another example of a place where it would need to be sealed to the subfloor that it's coming out of. Furnaces on the second floor are a perfect example of getting your air barrier up first before you penetrate that air barrier. Same concept as the drop ceiling where we get the air barrier to the bottom core of the truss. In this case, they pre-sheetrocked this whole furnace room on the second floor because the furnace cabinet is located inside conditioned space, but the primary duct system 
to deliver the second floor air is located in the ventilated attic space. So we need to have clear separation, again, between conditioned space and unconditioned space that's beyond that. So you can see the drywall here behind the duct system, and as they penetrate up into the attic, they've cut that drywall with right size holes that can be air sealed well. Uh, our con air conditioning lines, the uh, venting and air intake for the sealed combustion furnace and for the duct itself here. So they've done a really nice job here, but it all goes back to sequencing. Get your air barrier up first, then cut the right size hole, and ideally you'll have one thing going through one hole so that you can air seal it properly. Section R403.7 of the Energy Code uh, says that our equipment needs to be properly sized uh, before we install it. Uh, there are a couple issues with that. Uh, the first thing is that when we do our, it, we're required to do a manual J and a manual S, and we're not necessarily required to do a manual D. But when we do that HVAC design work, we have not yet uh, built the house. Uh, so we're, we're proposing to install the right insulation and have the right air tightness and whatnot. So it becomes really apparent that we want to ensure that we execute the construction of the house correctly so that our HVAC system can heat and cool the house properly. If I install the insulation poorly, I'm not getting its rated R value, and that rated R value is what I designed to. If I didn't install the air barrier system correctly, I'm not gonna get the house tightness correct, and the house tightness is what I've designed the system to, you know, to take into account. So the manual J is doing a heating and cooling load on the house. In order to size this system, uh, we have to have that load. We need to know how many BTUs we need to heat and cool the house on the coldest day of the year and on the warmest day of the year. Uh, then we use manual S to size the system to have the proper capacity to meet those heating and cooling loads. And then we use manual D to design the duct system to be able to deliver the load into each bedroom or, or living space in the house uh, here. So when we are doing that, again, it's super important to link up the HVAC design to our building thermal envelope characteristics and then ensure that they're executed properly at the end. Thanks so much for joining us for this series on energy code details out in the field, and we hope that you'll join us for some other ones.